and faithful. Thank you, Lord. Here we are, my brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. I want to welcome you to another Living Hope Today and let you know that today is a monumental day. It's the last day we will be in the book of 2 Peter. And what a book it's been. All the way back in 114, I think it was, Peter says, Look, my days are numbered. The Lord has shown me he's going to call me home soon. And from that point, we've listened as Peter instructs his audience with his final words. And that audience now is us. But he's told us about false teachers and how they'll infiltrate the church and what their motivations are and what to look for and how to protect yourself from these people that Satan sends to derail the church. And when you get to chapter 3, he's told us about the end of the world. He's told us about the total destruction that God is going to bring to his creation. Instead of by water, as in the days of Noah, God's destruction now will come by fire. The elements will melt. The universe, the heavens as it's called in Second Peter, will melt from such intense heat. Why is he telling us that? Well, he might want to tell us to let us know that judgment is coming. Whoever is, um, you know, opposing us and fighting against God, they will be judged. That might be one thing to learn from that. But the other thing is to look at the end of the world and bring the fact that God is going to sovereignly do what Peter's telling us, he's going to destroy his creation by fire on Judgment Day. We look at that and we say, okay, then I can endure anything that's happening now. What, what can the world throw at me that would derail me from holding on to the one who is sovereignly in control of all things and his plan will be played out perfectly in his own time? We think about the end of the world in terms of how to live to honor God now. So let's just think about that together for a second. He's told us that all of creation is going to be destroyed by fire. And one of the things we should do now is live in holiness. We should live in godliness. We should be people that are absolutely committed to obeying all that the Word of God says. We're, we're waiting for His coming. There's an anticipation, an eagerness, a an ability to overlook the circumstances of our daily lives and keep our minds focused on the fact that God is returning. And we hasten the day of God, as Peter talked about last time we studied together. The idea here is we're prepared. We're, we're not like in that illustration in, in the Gospels. We're not like those people that don't have oil in our lamps. We're ready. We're faithful. The, the trumpet sounds, we're raptured out, we're absolutely prepared to go. Living as we should, living as he's called us. And he says, look, we're, we're people that depend on the promises of God. Specifically, he mentions there's a promise of a new heaven and a new earth. That God not only is going to destroy this creation that's been tainted by sin, but he's going to restore his creation in the sense that he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. But what does that mean for us? Well, it means that there's going to be a sinless, undefiled, no evil has ever existed place where we will be with him forever. We've talked about that. Peter's telling us that. Why? To bring us hope. And as we move forward in this last section, just keep it in the back of your mind He's about to be martyred. Peter is going to be martyred not too far from here, as the Lord has shown him. What is he telling us? He's saying, therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, what are you doing? You're waiting. In other words, part of following Christ through the circumstances of our lives is to have patience, to understand that God has perfect timing. He will 
perform all that he said he would do, but it'll be on his schedule, not on ours. We have to have patience while we live this life. It might not go our way, as they say. We might not be experiencing our best life now, as the preachers promise in modern Christianity. We might have to wait and endure, persevere. But while we wait, what should we do? Peter says, look, be diligent. What does that mean? Pay attention to all the details. Look at everything you're doing. What are you thinking? What are you saying? How are you living? How's your interaction with the people in your life? Are you a loving person? Be diligent. Be diligent to do what? To be found by him. I, I love that. Jesus knows your name. He knows my name. He loves us. He died for us. We have come to him by faith through his grace and mercy. And we are not just a number. He's looking for you. He's looking for me. We're going to be found by him on that day. And guess what? He wants us to be without spot. He wants us to be without blemish. That our internal moral life would be absolutely pure before him. That our external moral life, how we treat others, would be honoring to God without spot or blemish. And that we would be at peace. You know, some people face the idea of death, even Christian people, with great anxiety. Uh, what, what if it's, you know, what if I believe something that's wrong, or I haven't been living in obedience, and what if I'm not ready when Jesus comes? Well, the point is, Peter's saying, look, don't let that even be an issue in your life. Be diligent. He's coming for you. Be sure that you've dealt with your life in a way that honors God. Don't have spot or blemish. Be at peace in your life. If Jesus comes today, are you ready? Is everything set in your heart and mind? Are you abiding in Christ and ready to go? That's what Peter calls us to as he prepares to go the same way himself. He's about to be martyred. He's probably not sure exactly how as he writes these words, but we know from history's account that that's going to be his fate. 315, he says, first be diligent. Now he says, count the patience of our Lord as salvation. What does that mean? That God waits not because he just enjoys watching all the suffering in life and uh, he's going to let it play out as long as he wants. No, God waits because he wants no one to perish. God doesn't end all this because he is giving people the opportunity to repent. Maybe a few more will come into the kingdom before the great and terrible day of the Lord makes it so that no one else will enter. When that door shuts, that door is shut for eternity. God leaves that door open, and as he waits for his culmination, we are called to do what? Count his patience as salvation. Lord, even if we have to suffer while we wait for your timing, we recognize that you are saving people while this interim time frame passes, and we are happy to wait. Bring them into the kingdom. Bring whoever will come. Find your elect. Call them in. We'll wait. That's the attitude we have. Just to, you know, this is this is great. I I studied this little passage in seminary. It always brings a smile to my face. Just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you, according to the wisdom given him. Now this is very insightful for us. This audience that Peter's addressing has been addressed by Paul as well. Okay, we're not given an audience um, place, like this isn't a letter to the church at Corinth or Ephesus or Philippian or Philippi as Peter introduces his letter. Who knows what Paul wrote? Was it one of those letters? Is Peter writing to the church at Rome, for instance? Or is it the case that there's another writing out there that might not have been canonized into the New Testament? But Paul has written according to the wisdom given him, again, 
another insightful moment in this verse that God is inspiring Scripture to be written. It wasn't Paul's wisdom. It was Paul's wisdom that was given to him. All right? What does Peter say? As he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. Okay, so what should we do? Well, <laughs> we should count the patience of our Lord as salvation. And that's what Paul was talking about. He does this on all his letters when he speaks of these matters. And then Peter says this. This is great. There are some things in them that are hard to understand. All right, what are we being told? Hey, Paul's a lawyer. Paul's going to make a complex argument that ties up every loophole to show that salvation comes from God, and it's by faith. It's not from the law. As he writes, the Spirit inspires him to think about every argument that might come against the truth that God inspires, and he counters those arguments with God's truth. Well, Peter's a former fisherman. He's not skilled in the legalese. And he's saying, look, when I read Paul, I mean, some of these things, I'm not sure I get exactly why he has to say it that way and why it's so intense. Just read the book of Romans. You'll see what I'm talking about in terms of the technical writing that Paul's capable of through the Spirit's power. He says, look, there's some things in them that are hard to understand. But then he says, look, there are ignorant and unstable people. And what do they do with what Paul says? Well, they twist what he says. They try to get out of what God wants by taking the arguments that Paul brings up and twisting them. And he says, look, these people, through their own destruction, they are going to pay the price for bringing this false teaching. In fact, it says here, as they do the other scriptures, they're not just limited to Paul's writings. They're twisting things from all through scripture. Why does Peter bring this up again? Again, he's warning us against false teachers. He's warning us to pay attention to what we hear, what we read. Is it biblical or not? Has God inspired it, or is it the opinion of somebody else, or the twisting of God's truth? Well, Peter, as he winds up the letter, he says, You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, knowing that people have this tendency to twist God's truth, even though they're ignorant people, even though they're unstable in their ways. Beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. Take care. What is that? Don't you remember he just told us, be diligent. Now he's telling us, take care. In other words, self-examination self-introspection, we have to know that we are rooted in what the Word says. We're not following myths. We're not following legends. We are basing our life on God's truth as revealed in God's Word. Be diligent. Take care. Don't be carried away with error. You're going you're gonna to run into lawless people. They're going to bring you lies. And the lies might sound good. Take care. He, Peter says, look, I don't want you to lose your own stability. I want you to stand firm. That's a, You know, Paul keeps telling us to stand firm. Well, here Peter says, don't lose your stability. Same thing, only just differently stated. Don't lose your stability. Stand firm in the truth. That's his parting instruction to us, or one of them. It's so critical for us to really examine how we handle the truth. Because to be lax in the handling of the truth, the understanding of the truth, is to open ourselves up to error. He says this on a positive note, but grow in grace. What's grace? Unmerited favor. How do I grow in grace? Well, not only do I appreciate more and more the grace God has shown me by allowing me to know Jesus Christ and forgiving me as a sinner and allowing me to uh, be brought into his kingdom. But in behavior, 
we can become people that show grace in our daily lives with the people that offend us, with the people that sin against us. We can grow. And I want you to see that word grow. Why? Because we're not told to just be stagnant. We're told to grow. All right? Pursue. Make every effort, as he said earlier in the letter. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is the Savior. He is the Christ. That's a packed little line right there, isn't it? But we're supposed to know that. We're supposed to know our scripture well enough and know the Lord well enough. It's not just about facts. It's the knowledge of the Lord. We abide in him. We know him personally. We study his word meticulously to be people that are well informed of what he commands and knowing him through the power of his spirit to be people that obey him well as well. And then as Peter concludes, he says, look, to him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. What do we do? We also glorify God all through the circumstances of this, this life and all the way into eternity. Peter says, Amen. Let it be. So just to sum it up, we had that list at the beginning of this Living Hope Today, but in these last few verses, he's told us to be diligent. He's told us to be found without spot or blemish. He's told us to be at peace. We're ready to go. We're content in him. We've, we've lived a life of obedience. We need to look at God's delay in his coming as his, his salvation for those that he's still calling into the kingdom. We count God's patience as salvation. We don't let ourselves be carried away by error. We examine the truth. We don't want to lose our stability. We want to grow in grace and knowledge. And we want to be people that glorify God. These are some of the lessons of Second Peter. I hope you've gained some insight into God's word, insight into the second coming of Jesus, insight into how to deal with false teachers as we've gone through this letter. Questions and comments are always welcome. And I pray you're serving well today, church. God bless you.